just before the March tournament, I got the weird feeling something was about to permanently change, and possibly for the worse. And I thought, what could this be? For apart from the change of location, I had seen nothing unusual in the tournament build-up. Yet, much as I hoped it was just green shoots and pink buds of cherry blossom spring transforming the landscape, I felt the urge to look more carefully, take stock, and value what was actually there. Three days into the tournament, I could finally begin to process it, and piece together the clues within the eyewitness accounts I'll now give you. My core assumption, and perhaps yours, was that Hakuho would dominate. That his body, given vital extra time off, would still serve that purpose. It's all about how I manage my injuries, he'd long been telling us. Get that right, and I can aim for two titles a year instead of one, then three instead of two. We wished he could aim for all six as he'd done for a decade, but knew Mother Time had drained his youth and reconciled ourselves, just as he did, to the maxim that Hakuho would compete less, but generally win when he did. That maxim, for three years, even his critics would accept. So special is his presence. Their faith, as ours, as his, strengthened by his salamander-like powers of limb regeneration. He came runner-up within weeks of a bicep tear, beat Shodai and Mitake Umi to practice ring pulp just after a knee operation. And in booming tones did he attribute all this to his rare genetic mix of Mongolian, African and Okinawan, discovered by doctors in 2019, and boosting his sense of invincibility. Thus, over the past eight months, had we watched the apparent sideshow, waited and expected. Treasure his absence, pretenders, we thought, and win while you can, because once this man returns, you'll be weeping. And I think that was what helped sustain us over that long run of flat days where nothing much seemed to happen. The hope that the master would soon triumphantly return. Such was the terror he was seemingly bound to strike that I wanted to put his first ring-entering ceremony back to Lalo Schifrin's shifting gears the piercing atonal organ set to crescendo with a zoom on his menacing eyes. And it's true that on opening day, the towering figures of September, November and January seemed to greatly diminish in his presence. Until, that is, we really began to look. By virtue of long absence strengthening fond memories, Hakuho arrived in the arena that day largely as a mental impression gilded with past achievements, but he departed it in a vastly more human form. Within the sacred white belt, he looked as fine as we'd ever remembered. Without it though, he looked strangely vulnerable, the apparent purpose in his stride melting once he reached the ring standing more as one bemused to be back than as a bullish champion in waiting. He seemed scared of losing these moments, of failing to answer the chairman's call to make up for Kakuryu's absence with fine sumo until the final day. A once needless reminder to perform had now become a daunting challenge. Then came the sight of twin elbow supporters, tape on wrist, knee and toe, and cautious footstamps, seemingly putting into motion a mental reset among all present. The eyes of everyone were glued to him, even those of Dai Eisho's Yobidashi, no longer due to magnetic aura, but to genuine concern that this could be the last time. How is he walking? How does he squat? Is there anything which suggests he's going away? I'm not as well versed in decoding wrestler movement as the ringside team, but I still vowed to keep the camera on him for as long as possible, lowering it only to allow my naked eyes some unfiltered privilege, lest it not be there to enjoy next week. 
This is the wrestling genius I used to pray would lose, just for the sake of making sumo more interesting. Now, for the first time, I found myself fearing he would lose, and be a great man humbled. For Dai Eishou's thrusts, as January had shown, had the power to humiliate. Then it dawned on me. I was no longer watching Hakuho. I was watching someone very much like him, with almost identical face and belt, but not someone I knew. The Hakuho of my mind had become a man I used to know. The bouts, of course, confirmed it. Ten years prior, he'd have leapt forward, crushed Dai Eishou's hands with his chest, and flung him to Kingdom Come with an outside left. Even three years prior, he'd have met fire with fire, and used his longer reach to outthrust him. But here was all about protection, mobilizing every remaining and limited resource merely to block, cling, and dive. To destroy where his once free-moving body could no longer create. On day two, we saw more of Hakuho the man, obliged to wait for his foe to move before gaining his chance to throw. In our minds, he would have tugged hard, reached over the top, and found the throw of his own accord. Not this time. No longer. Still, I sought to disbelieve. It's Hakuho, I told myself. He's limitless. Look, he squatted in the end. He must be okay. But the initial shock I received when news of his pullout reached me was perhaps the final one needed to demolish my long-held mental image. For by the end of Tuesday's Kokugikan bouts, resembling a party after half the guests have left, I'd resign myself to the facts, that no matter how much I, we, he, imagined it, trained for it maniacally, Hakuho was not going to descend from high, deus ex machina, lowered by the canopy's motored suspension cables and into the ring, to send men tumbling with the merest snap of fingers. At least, not before several other body parts snapped. The man we now see can give zero guarantees. His crumbling fighter's frame had prepared for eight whole months, and still only lasted two days. The something about to change pre-tournament simply had to be this. The psychologically, I must accept that whereas sublime Hakuho shall eternally be the king of Sumo, the shattered man we see before us now cannot be the king of the current ring.